so first things first, uh, thanks for showing up at 10 o'clock on a Sunday. I, I can only imagine the caliber of hangovers everybody is suffering from today. So I'll try to speak nice and softly. And uh, you know, if you guys want to take a little nap during this, that's totally fine too. Uh, just appreciate that you're here. So we're here to talk about PowerShell, uh, incorporating it into your arsenal using a tool I wrote called PS Attack. Uh, my name is Jared Haight. I'm a security engineer with Gotham Digital Science uh, based out of their office in Charlotte. Uh, with my wife, I'm the co-owner of the neediest dog on the face of the earth with just no sense of personal space whatsoever and a broken bunny. Uh, Bruiser had a really bad weekend a while ago and now his head is stuck crooked. Uh, so he looks really curious all the time and super cute. So there have been at least, I don't know, like three dozen PowerShell talks at Derby this year. So if somehow you have made it to Sunday and you still don't know what PowerShell is, uh, this section's for you. All right. So PowerShell is a command line shell and scripting language that Microsoft created uh, about 10 years ago. And they created it to uh, basically be used for configuration and automation. Uh, it's built into .NET, so it provides super easy access to like all the powerful stuff that .NET has had for years and kind of built up. Uh, and also provides really easy access to COM and WMI, so some of the legacy or long-term uh, APIs that you have for managing Windows, super easy to use within PowerShell. It's gained a lot of popularity because it's a really awesome language. It's really well designed. Uh, Microsoft had the benefit of kind of approaching this blank slate of a scripting language and looking at what has worked for other scripting languages in the past, what hasn't, and kind of built PowerShell to be kind of a best of breed modern language. Uh, some of the cool things that uh, they've been able to do is kind of enforce these conventions throughout PowerShell that make it really intuitive. So the commandlets are all in this like verb noun format, uh, which kind of makes things a little bit verbose, but it makes it really easy to understand what's going on and figure out what it is you need to do. So you have commands like, you know, get content or set content, you know, instead of like cat or, you know, what have you. Uh, there is also the switches throughout all of the uh, commandlets are very similar. They're all kind of speak the same language. If you're going to be talking to another computer, you're going to use the computer name parameter. <clears throat> the other really cool thing is from the very beginning, they have this big focus on building a usable help system, which I think is the first time Microsoft has thought to do that. Uh, what they ended up with is kind of like man pages if man pages were written by normal people instead of like computer science doctorates. Uh, the other great thing about it is that it's object oriented. Now this is where developers in the room and like manifestation may be mumbling to themselves that like, oh, PowerShell is an object oriented because of, you know, blah, blah, blah. Well. I'm not a developer by trade. I'm actually a sysadmin who just keeps developing things and pushing them out. Uh, and so my take on this whole object-oriented thing is like PowerShell uses objects. The language is oriented around the objects. So as far as I'm concerned, it's an object-oriented language. I'm sure, there's developer minutia in there that people love to argue about, but I really don't care. So it's being used for pretty much exactly what Microsoft, a lot of what Microsoft intended it to be used for, a lot of administration. So a lot of the modern, like uh, the Exchange Management Console or the new version of uh, Active Directory uh, Administrative Center, which is the new version of users and computers, those are really just these GUIs that sit in front of PowerShell and just run PowerShell commands in the background. Um, and what's cool about those is you can actually enable a view where you can see all the commands that they're running in the background. Makes it really easy to script out whatever it is you're trying to do. Being used a lot for automation. So Microsoft has been pushing this, uh, this thing called DSC. It's desired state config. And it's kind of their approach to the whole like configuration as code, uh, you know, movement. Uh, so kind of similar to like your chefs or, uh, Ansible's or what have you. Uh, and actually those uh, chefs and Ansible's, a lot of those, uh, their Windows clients rely a lot on PowerShell for configuration. 
So real powerful tool, really like used in the industry. It's also seen a lot of pickup in InfoSec. <clears throat> so a lot of great projects for data forensics, uh, instant response. If that is your cup of tea, you really need to hit up invoke-ir.com. It's a site by Jared Atkinson. Uh, it's a project that he's created, and he also has just a lot of tools and stuff up there. That dude does a lot of really cool work with data forensics uh, and is really like one of the big names out there just pushing PowerShell as a IR platform. So really cool stuff up there. But I'm a red teamer. Uh, I, I like to break things and occasionally fix them. So for us, PowerShell is really, really cool. Uh, it is notoriously hard to block because uh, PowerShell isn't actually PowerShell.exe. It's a DLL that's provided by .NET, and PowerShell.exe just kind of serves as a wrapper for that, that provides input so you can execute commands off of it. Uh, blocking PowerShell.exe doesn't actually achieve a whole lot if your goal is to block PowerShell execution within your environment. The other cool thing about the uh, PowerShell community, or uh, the InfoSec PowerShell, uh, is the community that's come up around it. There are a lot of incredibly talented developers and security researchers creating tools in PowerShell. I really think that the work the PowerShell, the offensive PowerShell community is doing is really at the forefront of red teaming and pushing tactics and kind of just driving the industry forward. Um, and a lot of that uh, comes from they, the people that develop this stuff, they have very mature methodology. They've been doing red teaming for a long time. They've been doing development for a long time. So the benefit of that is you'll see a big focus on like not leaving forensic evidence with your PowerShell tools and, you know, using like WMI, using existing APIs within Windows to achieve whatever it is they're trying to achieve as opposed to calling like binaries, which could possibly be logged or monitored. Uh, the other great thing is, as uh, mature developers, the tools that the offensive PowerShell community creates can really be like looked at as like the gold standard of like how to write a proper PowerShell script. Um, their tools they fully integrate with PowerShell's help system. They use all the right parameters. They feel like native PowerShell commands. Uh, so just a really lot of great stuff coming out of there. Uh, Obviously, InfoSec has really embraced PowerShell. But I think a lot of us know that PowerShell is really cool and it's really powerful, but if you sat most pen testers at a console, they wouldn't know the first thing to do. And so I think a lot of that has to do with it's kind of hard to stay up on all that's happening, all the exciting stuff that's going on with you know the offense community. There's kind of this like click of like, I don't know, a dozen, 15 people that like, you really have to follow them on Twitter and like to stay up on all the cool stuff that's going on. And the other thing is like, pen testers, we don't use Windows. We use Linux and we use OS X. We attack Windows. Like Windows is a target. It's not like a development platform where we can make tools and stuff. And so there's that getting people excited about Windows is a really, really hard thing to do. Uh, no matter how cool the tools are that are out there. So that led me to create PS Attack. So PS Attack is a custom console that's designed to emulate PowerShell. And so if you are familiar with PowerShell, you can sit down, you can get to work and, you know, do some, wreck some havoc. If you're not familiar with PowerShell, it's really easy to get started using PS Attack. And the things that you learn using PS Attack should translate over to an actual PowerShell console. Um, the uh, great thing about it is I build it so that it's a single executable, uh, super lightweight. You just download it, run it, and it's ready to go. Inside PS Tech are a hundred some odd commands that cover really like the whole range of an engagement. Uh, and it includes a lot of like, uh, modules from popular frameworks that you might have heard of like Power Tools and Power Exploit and uh, Nisheng. Uh, as well as some lesser tools that I just think are really awesome, but just haven't gotten that like wide awareness. Uh, so Inve is a great tool that uh, basically implements Responder, but in PowerShell. Uh, the same developer, Kevin Robertson, did uh, an implementation of the hot potato attack called Tater in, P in a PS1 file in PowerShell. 
So a lot of great work being done by the community that just, you know, I'm trying to kind of surface out. The thing I added to PS Tech, uh, is I realized with 110 commands, you know, and probably more now, it's kind of overwhelming. Like you're back at that. Where do I start? Like, I just want to hack shit. Where's the hack shit button? So I included a commandlet called get attack. And get attack serves as basically a search engine for attacks within PS attack. So here you can see we're searching for passwords. It's going to come back with Mimikatz, get GPP, GPP password, uh, and, you know, other tools within it. Basically, if you're looking to do something, you can use Git attack to figure out what commands you need to run. And then I also, I wanted to build something that wasn't just a training uh, tool, so not something that you would just use in labs, something that could actually be beneficial on engagements. So I've tried to play around a bit to make sure that it, it helps to evade IR and AV. Uh, and one of the things I do there is the modules that are part of PS Attack, all those offensive tools, they're actually encrypted before they're bundled into the PS Attack binary. And then when PS Attack starts, those uh, modules are decrypted into RAM and then run from there. So the plain text payloads never actually touch disk. Uh, the other cool thing is that it works just out of the box on Windows 7 all the way up to the latest version of Windows 10. And since it is PowerShell, it does support PowerShell's awesome help system. So all those great commands that, you know, use git attack to figure out what command you want to use, you can then use git help to figure out how to use it. So let's do a little demo here. that hopefully doesn't fall apart for me. So in this scenario, uh, we have a desktop that either we've come across, you know, it's an unlocked desktop, or maybe we got uh, some low-level user creds to an RDP instance. So we're gonna go ahead and start up PS Attack. And the first thing I wanna do is fix this whole low-level user privileges thing, right? So we're gonna run get attack, and we're gonna look for what we can do for escalation. And a whole lot comes back. Uh, a lot of it's provided by PowerUp, which is a great uh, collection of common misconfigurations in Windows that allow for privilege escalation. So uh, service, uh, service EXEs that have real loose permissions that we can go ahead and overwrite and restart and stuff like that. Um, you know, unattended install files that may have passwords in them. The one I want to run here, though, is invoke MS16032. So if you're not familiar with MS-16032, uh, it's obviously a relatively recent exploit that is a privilege escalation based off the secondary logon service in Windows. Uh, there's a problem with the way it holds, handles handles. So uh, what we can do is just run invoke MS-16032. And that drops us into a system command prompt. So we're running as system now. Let's go ahead and start VS attack again. So now that we have system privileges, we can run Mimikatz. If you're not familiar with Mimikatz, Mimikatz is like a Swiss army knife of credential scraping and memory scraping in Windows. It does a whole lot of really cool stuff. Uh, the main thing people use it for, though, is dumping creds. So let's go ahead and uh, see what our options are for running Mimikatz. So one option, invoke Mimikatz. Uh, let's go ahead and look at the help function for this. So, like I said, the help system in PowerShell is great. So we have a synopsis of what it actually does. We have our, you know, credits to the authors and links, all the parameters that, you know, the command takes. What we're interested in is the dump creds uh, param. So let's go ahead and do that. And hopefully this works, because I've run this demo, like, one in five times. Like, I don't actually get the creds that I wanted to, so... Hopefully that does not happen now. Oh, of course it does. All right, we're going to cheat here. All right, let's try that again. All 
Hey, what do you know? We have plain text credits in here now. Uh, so this account here, uh, this audit nom nom account, uh, we see that it's a member of the domain uh, and its password is change me one. So we're going to go back to our domain user uh, instance of PS Attack, and we're going to do some investigation to see what this audit nom nom account is all about. So we'll use GetAttack again, and we'll search for stuff involving users. So a lot of recon is provided by a module called PowerView, uh, which is this great collection of just like domain enumeration scripts and stuff like that. Uh, the command that we're interested in is git net user, which is really just a replacement for the net users domain command. Uh, so let's go ahead and run that, git net user, whoops. That is all the users. Let's run it just against audit nom nom. All right, so a couple of interesting things come back here, right? So we can see that it's a service count, or at least it's in the service counts OU. We can also see that he is a member of domain admins because he's a service count, so we'll just make him a domain admin. He probably needs access to something, I'm sure. Let's go ahead and start PSTAC, though, as audit nom nom. All right, so we have our DA creds. <clears throat> the next thing I want to do, because we're just sitting in some dude's cube, like he may be coming back from lunch or whatever. So let's set up some persistence, right? So we'll do a git attack, persist. And there is currently one utility. And the reason there is one utility is when I was putting this demo together for DerbyCon, I really wanted to demonstrate persistence. And then I looked in VS Tag and I didn't have any commands for persistence. And then I looked around for commands that like did persistence kind of the way I wanted to, which is just like, hey, I want to set up a scheduled task that runs this command and give it some params. And there's really nothing out there. Um, there's some native commandlets in PowerShell, but they're only available in, I think, 3.0 and up for scheduled tasks. Uh, since we're on Windows 7, we're in 2.0, so like we have nothing. So I wrote a real simple commandlet that basically just lets you set up scheduled tasks. So let's go ahead and look at some examples of that. Uh, the example switch is my favorite thing about Git help. So let's do that, and then examples. And here we have like three examples of, hey, here's how you can actually use whatever tool you're trying to use. Uh, most of the tools provided by the offensive community have examples built in. Uh, Mimikatz is a great example. I think they have four, four to seven just different, you know, here's how to use Mimikatz. Uh, so real helpful. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to do a time-based uh, scheduled task. So, like, it's going to start at a certain time. So, time, uh, we're going to name this updater. Uh, we're going to have this run under our uh, audit nom nom user. Uh, we're going to set this up to repeat. Repeat every 90 minutes. And let's see, we're going to run PowerShell. And the arguments we're going to provide, I'm going to cheat here. So if you have seen any uh, PowerShell before, you've probably seen this. Uh, this is a simple download cradle. Uh, so what this is going to do, let's get that all on screen for you guys. All right, so what this is going to do, it creates a new uh, .NET object, uh, a web client object. It's going to download the contents of this file. It's going to call invoke expression on the contents of that file. So it's going to load it into the PowerShell instance. And then we're going to run, uh, in this case, it's downloading a command called invoke metasploit payload. So we're going to run invoke metasploit payload and point it at a URL. Now, what I've done is gone ahead and base 64 would this. PowerShell natively supports commands sent to it as base 64 screen, uh, screens. And it's just a good way to get around any sort of like, uh, you know, issues within the shell. So, you know, extra quoting or, you know, special characters or what have you. It's just a good reliable way to get around all that. So let's go ahead and copy this and we will send that as our argument.
All right, so it returns some XML. That means that we successfully created our scheduled task. If we look over at our Kali instance, we should get a shell. All right, so we should see it come in here soon and download the ims.ps1 file. Uh, the schedule tasks uh, commandlet, if you do a time-based schedule task, at least the one that I created, it, unless you, if you don't specify a start time, it just starts it in 30 seconds. So hopefully we should see it come across here shortly. Hopefully. This part of the demo has never failed as far as like me testing it out. So this would be a first. Yeah. <laughs> well, that is a complete shame. I, I am not going to troubleshoot this live on stage, so I'm sorry. Just so here's like what would happen. You would see uh you know a little request come into Python over here. And then in our Metasploit instance, we would see a shell come in and everybody would applaud. I can't believe that didn't work. <laughs> it's, uh just the bottom half. Did I copy the whole damn thing? Yeah, no, that should have been right. All right, well, demo fail. Yeah, we'll see if we can run it manually. Why not? Okay, well, yeah, that's definitely a demo fail. We're not going to be able to fix that one live. Anyway, so we'll pretend that worked and move on. Yeah, that was awesome, right? <laughs> you guys are the best. All right, so I think VS Attack is pretty cool uh, when it works. Uh, and But I know that there are obviously some shortcomings, right? So... All the versions, if you go to github.com, you download the uh, source code and you compile it, or even if you download uh, the binaries, the releases that are up there, they all use the same encrypted files, right? <clears throat> so those are signatures that AV can pick up on because they're the same. And that has really started happening. Um, people keep uploading PS attack to virus total, uh, which is a pain for me, but I totally understand why people would do it. Uh, if PS attack ends up on your network, you probably should know there's like, there's no good reason PS attack should be on your network. Uh, so I totally get people uploading it to virus total, getting that information out there. Uh, the other thing is, uh, with the modules being built into PS attack, it's kind of a point in time snapshot of those scripts, right? And the PowerShell community is incredibly active. So every day, like new scripts are coming out or updates are happening. Uh, and those aren't being incorporated into PS Tech. It's always going to be a little bit behind. The other thing is PowerShell is incredibly awesome and you should be writing your own stuff. Or maybe you have like this, you know, obfuscated version of Mimikatz that you want to rely on. So I wanted to make it easy to incorporate your own tools, you know, and get around all this. So I created the PS Attack build tool. And what the PS Attack build tool does is it downloads the latest release of PS Attack. It downloads all the modules and stuff that it depends on, encrypts those with a unique key, and then it, this is new. It goes through the PS attack source code and looks for common strings like PS attack and replaces those with like random strings now. So kind of trying to get, get rid of the uh, static, you know, signatures that AV might be picking up on. And then it compiles all this for you. You don't need a build environment. You just run the exe and it, just compiles everything for you. It's pretty great. 
And at the end, you get your own copy of PS Attack that is custom made for you. So here's a demo of PS Attack running. Uh, yeah, sure. Yep. That is coming up, my friend. Why aren't you playing, Mr. Video? Man, this is like the worst like demo I have ever given. Also coming, yes. It, it is actually the same answer to his question. All right, you know what? Hit the PS Attack build tool. When you double click it, it does all that stuff I said on the previous slide. <laughs> Man, this sucks. So the dependencies are super light for the build tool. Uh, you need .NET 3.5 full to build, you actually build PS Attack. And it's, that actually what provides MS Build, which is what we're using to compile everything. And you also need .NET 4.5 or higher because uh, of some of the dependencies within the build tool. Now, to answer the questions of how do I incorporate my own tools, how do I see uh, you know, what tools PS Attack is downloading, the build tool relies on a file called modules.json. So it's a simple JSON file. Uh, basically, you give it your, your thing a name and point it to a URL, and it's going to go download that PS1 file and build it into uh, PS Attack. So this is where, like I said, if you know you have these obfuscated versions of Mimikatz or you know a different fork or whatever you want to use, easy to update it here and uh, incorporate it into your uh, version of PS Attack. So uh, both PS Attack and the build tool are available on my GitHub, uh, GitHub.com/JaredHate. They both have pre-compiled binaries available on the releases tab, so super easy to just download and run. Um, and yeah. Uh, I encourage everybody to go out and do that. But I want to take, take kind of a break here and do a little story time, all right? So <clears throat> a while ago, uh, I gave a talk at B-Sides Charleston. Uh, the talk was an intro to PowerShell and how to use it for evil, uh, which coincidentally happens to be the name of the class I'm giving next month if you are interested in learning about PowerShell. <laughs> So I'll give this talk, and uh, it goes pretty well. It was uh, just a real simple introduction, like, hey, you had never scripted before. Here's, how to, you know, here's what all the scripting terminology is, and here's some of the cool stuff you can do with PowerShell. Uh, the, the one mistake I made, uh, you know, the, the one little regret I have about the talk, is uh, during the Q&A, somebody asked me, like, how would you defend against all these PowerShell attacks? And in my head, what I meant to say was something to the effect of like, you know, hey, I'm, I've been very focused on the offense side. I, you know, I'm not really familiar with the, on the defense side. Uh, you know, so that's something I'm going to look into and, you know, I, I leave that as an exercise to the, you know, audience. Uh, what actually came out of my mouth was I break things, I don't fix them. Which is like, as those words were queuing up, I'm like, man, that is, no, that, do not say that. That's like the worst possible thing to say. Like, you're an idiot. So the good thing was, you know, it was besides Charleston. It was a smaller environment. So, you know, the impact was, you know, relatively limited. I learned my lesson and, uh, you know, we all move on. So then Security Tube retweeted my video. Uh, and that was kind of cool, right? And then Jeffrey Snover retweeted my video. Uh, if you're not familiar with Jeffrey Snover, he was the keynote speaker here. Uh, he is the, he's a technical fellow at Microsoft, which is the highest engineering position Microsoft has. He, uh, created PowerShell and is now over like Windows Server and Windows Cloud and all this stuff. So like, that was mind blowing. Like, oh my God, Jeffrey Snover, like not only retweeted it, but apparently watched like some of the video enough to make a quote of something I said. Like, that was awesome. And then Manifestation tweeted something. And so 
I have looked up to Matt for a long time. He is definitely one of those guys that is just leading, like, offensive, like, research. And, like, the dude's awesome. Like, so seeing this, like, that was a punch in the stomach. Like, I was, like here's this dude that I look up to, like, telling me that I'm an asshole. So, <laughs> but, you know, so I, like, I tweet at Matt. I'm like, oh, my God, dude, I know I was, you were right. Like, I, as soon as I was saying that, you know, and then I, like, tweeted out to my 10 followers. I'm like, yeah, you know, you should totally... <laughs> Like, we need to fix things. That's what security is about, right? So then uh, Matt actually DM'd me. Uh, and as you can see in this, like, completely unedited DM, uh, we made up. Um, and now we're, like, BFFs, uh, which is really great. Like, you know, we're, we're always hanging out now. And, you know, it's just there's some really good stuff going on between me and Matt now, like a real, real bromance going on. But with all that said, I need to atone for B-Sides Charleston, right? If for, if for no other reason than, like, everybody I talk to in the, like, offensive PowerShell community will not let go of this fucking, like, I break things, I don't fix them <laughs> things. Like, at least once a day I hear some joke about it. So let's talk about defending against PS attack, <laughs> or PowerShell. So here's the big secret about PowerShell. It's not special. It's not doing anything that, <laughs> sorry, Lee. <laughs> it, it's special, but not in, you know what I'm saying. So, <clears throat> well, now I'm going to hear about that for another six months. Uh, so, really, PowerShell is a post-exploitation language, right? So it's using existing exploits. It's using existing problems in the environment and just leveraging that. So really, the best thing you can do to defend against PowerShell attacks is just basic security hygiene. So the best thing you can do, right, is you know, start protecting your privileged access accounts. And that includes local admins. Uh, if your local admins are all using the same password and they can all log into any computer on the domain over the network, that is 90% of the reason why I would need domain admin to hack your stuff, right? Those are basically, you basically give me all the function of the domain admin that I would need to run throughout your network. So implement something like LAPS, implement something like SHIPS from a trusted sec. Uh, LAPS is super cool from Microsoft, and I wish it was advertised better. It's a fully supported tool for randomly changing local admin passwords in your network. What it does is it pushes out this uh, agent, sits on the computers, and it just changes the password and then uploads it to a protected attribute in AD. And then you can give access to that attribute to like your help desk and monitor its access and reset passwords once a password has been accessed. So really great solution. Like I said, it's fully supported by Microsoft. Definitely something you should be looking into. The other thing is there is probably no reason your local admins need to be able to log into other machines over the network. So fix that. There's a simple group policy change that you can push out that will prevent your local admins from, you know, migrating throughout the network. It cuts off that lateral movement. The other cool thing that, you know, that's kind of come up recently uh, is a lot of times when we think about protecting access throughout the network, we think about protecting lower user, uh, low privileged users from accessing like high privilege or sensitive information. The way we should also add to that is protecting high-privileged accounts from accessing lower-privileged workstations. So like your domain admin accounts, domain admin is so much more than like, I just need to be an administrator on all the boxes in the domain. And if you're using your domain admin accounts that way, you're really abusing those accounts and they're way over-privileged for what you need. So consider, like, do your domain admins actually need to log into end-user workstations? They probably don't. You can probably create a separate tier of admins to handle that. Domain admin accounts should be used for administering the domain. Same thing goes for service accounts, right? Your service accounts probably don't need DA rights, no matter what the vendors are telling you. And I've been that lazy sys, well, I've been that overworked sys admin who, you know, there's like, I've been the lazy sys admin too. Uh, that's why I like PowerShell. 
So, but you know, I've had like 20 things on my plate. I have this dude screaming at me that like our VoIP server isn't working. Like, fuck it, give the VoIP service account DA rights. We'll visit it later. That's a, a terrible approach. And I understand it happens, but you know, we need to go back and fix that and really provision our service accounts to have the privileges that they need and only be able to access the resources that they need. Does your VoIP service account need to be able to log into end user workstations? Probably not. Jessica Payne, going on to, you know, okay, so we have our, our privileged access. We know what we need to do there. We also need to be aware of what's going on in the uh, environment. And Jessica Payne published a great article about this. Uh, I really wish that this article was out when I was a sysadmin because there are so many event logs. There are so many event IDs. Like, where do you start? And this article tells you that. Like, here are the five things you need to monitor. And like, right now, start monitoring this in your domain. It also covers how to roll out centralized event forwarding using just existing Windows tools. Uh, it's all built into Windows. So a lot of great information there. Like, highly recommend you read that article. For PowerShell specifically, the best thing you can do is update PowerShell. Uh, every release of PowerShell comes with new security features and enhanced logging. So if you get up to like PowerShell v5, you get like basically over the shoulder transaction logging. Like you can see everything that was typed into the console. It's amazing. For example, when you start PS attack on a box that just has PS v5 and logging cranked all the way up, it generates something like 420 event logs. And that includes the plain text loading, as you can see here, of Mimicat. So any script, even though it's decrypted, it's coming across RAM, that the event log, so you can actually alert on it. The counter, the, the addendum to this is that when you update PowerShell, make sure to remove PowerShell 2.0. Because if both are available, PS attack is just going to use 2.0, and none of that transaction logging is supported there has some logging, but nowhere near the depth that PSV5 supports. And to kind of leave you guys with some stuff to read, uh, Goatee PFE did a great, it's kind of this, uh, this post, but it's also a collection of links called Who's Afraid of PowerShell Security? Uh, definitely a great read, uh, many resources in there. And Sean Metcalf did, a, as per usual, a great post on detecting PowerShell attack tools. And he actually includes PS attack in there. Uh, and just a very succinct, if you're not reading Sean's blog, it is a treasure trove of information. Uh, adsecurity.org. Um, everything that dude publishes is just very succinct and to the point, like his ability to just like info dump uh, on a page is amazing. So definitely suggest that. Last thing I would recommend is following Jessica Payne on Twitter and just do whatever it is she says. Uh, she is an awesome instant responder at Microsoft. And same as Sean, just this incredibly low signal to noise ratio. Like everything she tweets is like gold and should like instantly be like researched and jumped upon. So wrapping up, uh, to remind you, I talked about PS attack earlier. Uh, now that we've talked about the defense stuff, uh, I created it to make it easy for people to start using PowerShell offensively and to learn about it. Uh, use the build tool because it's awesome and that's where a lot of my uh, work is going into. And really just, I would really love any sort of feedback that you guys have. Like if you run into issues, if something's broken or it doesn't work the way you expect it to, submit an issue, let me know. Uh, if you know how to write C-sharp, I would greatly benefit, benefit from that, because I don't know how to write C-sharp. I'm just figuring this out as I go along. As you can probably tell by like the massive code and possible stability issues that PS Tech has. So if you know C-sharp, if you have a quick fix, like submit a pull request. I would love it. But really just any sort of feedback. Like I love hearing about people using PS attack on engagements. That makes me so happy to hear about. Or like, hey, you know, I'm new to this PowerShell thing. PS attack was super helpful. I love hearing about that. And if you want to tell me my tool sucks, like as long as it's constructive, that's fine too. The last thing I want to do is really give a shout out to the, the real MVPs. Uh, PS attack without these guys would just be PS and that wouldn't be super impressive. Uh, these guys are really the guys that created all the offensive modules that PS Tech relies on. 
And I had mentioned earlier that, you know, Twitter click that, you know, you can follow to kind of stay up on what's going out. Uh, this is really your starting point for that. Like, follow these people. They're, they're all really solid people. So, uh, let's see. I am Jared Haight on Twitter. Like, comment, subscribe. Hi folks, Alan Geek here. We pretty much don't have audio on this video until the very end. Some some kind of a crash, I believe, of Ava Media. So I apologize for the inconvenience.